And now, you're tuned in to RBLR, the home of Tampa Bay's Reveler Sports. What's going on, RBLR Nation? You are tuning in to the Rays portion of these fantastic RBLR podcasts. Uh, I am Zach Blaine, one of your hosts on this show, and here with me, uh, we have two people today, which is wild, I know. But we have Mr. Ben Whitelaw. How you doing, Ben? Hey, good morning, Zach. How's it going? Oh, it is going, and even better now that we've got the one and only Mr. Matt Germain. How are you doing today, sir? Excellent. Living the dream. Perfect. I love to hear it. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit of Rays baseball today. Sounds good to me. Yeah, so uh, we're really happy to have you on today, Matt, and we wanted to get your uh, your thoughts on some prospect and minor league related stuff. Um, I'm sure people have seen it on Twitter, but you're all over the, the Rays minor league scene, and you've got some really great insights, so we wanted to get your opinion on a couple uh, specific questions here. Sounds good. Rock on. All right. Um, I guess I'll I'll start it off here then, Zach. So um, we just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, your thoughts on the Rays' ability to like overhaul prospects pretty quickly. Like you know they'll get guys in, maybe they'll keep them, develop them for a while, but sometimes they do like to flip them to another team in, in packages or you know for for bigger pieces. So what are your thoughts on how the Rays are able to do that um, with such great success? So I think that the first thing to realize is that they seem on the surface, and this is like broadly speaking, it's not a hard and fast rule, but they seem to focus on two types of prospects. Uh, there's the long-term guys that they want as projects and guys they can control over the long haul. And usually that's like the Blake Snell kind of deal where they get a package back uh, and they're able to develop them over time and having control over those guys is the key. Uh, you could say the same for the uh, the Tommy Pham deal and a couple of other ones. Uh, Nate Lowe is another one where they just didn't have room for him and they wanted guys that they could develop over time. Um, so those are a little bit different. I think you can put Shane Baz, uh, Luis Patino, Blake Hunt, even the Archer deal way before that kind of set the tone for that kind of deal for them as a franchise. Uh, and then you have the other kind of prospect, which they seem to have been better at rounding off the rosters with recently. So you have guys that they go and get like uh, Harold Ramirez, uh, Luke Rayleigh, um, a lot of the re relief pitchers that they've gotten over the years, like the last two or three years, are mature guys that seem to be willing to learn. And so they'll take a Jason Adam and they'll say, we don't know why Chicago couldn't you know, use them in, in a productive <laughs> way. We'll take them and we'll just tinker that last little bit to get him in, in the right form. And I, you look at him pitch with the Rays and you're like, how did they not get this guy going? Like, it doesn't make any sense. So they're able to, between those two, round off a lot of their minor league systems so that they're just dominating all the way through the, the system as well as doing well on, on the major league level. So in general, that's what I would say. Okay. So so with that, you kind of mentioned like they, they do – They'll find stuff that other people couldn't necessarily fix or couldn't figure out. Um, would you say that, like, what are some things that you think maybe the Rays overvalue compared to some other teams in the in the league? I, I, it's hard to call it an overvalue, but there's two things when you when you pass me that question that I thought of, and and one of them is kind of a broader, fine point at the end of the season. So I think they overvalue money if that makes any sense. And the, 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 so if you take the last two seasons of the playoffs and you add to the budget, let's say you add the money to keep a, a Charlie Morton around or the money to go and get that extra piece from the Cubs when, when the trade deadline comes around, they would have made more money from the how far they made it into the playoffs than they paid those players. So it's a weird thing to say but it's it's a kind of a it's a budgeting issue where the cap for them is so hard and fast that it doesn't give them that extra room to push them over the edge in a lot of ways. And maybe ownership will learn from that. Maybe they won't. But if Stu's as smart as I think he, would, he is, I think that they'll be a little bit looser with the pocket, you know, change uh, this time around if they make it as far. Uh, the other thing I thought of was was basically leaving so much in the pen's ability to dominate and some of those relievers that it becomes a fallacy 
And, and that's a hard thing to gauge because you do want to have so much faith in those relievers that you can kind of uh, eliminate a lot of the risk from having a, a weaker style rotation or a younger rotation. And we saw in the playoffs against the Red Sox and the young rotation they had, and they were leaning on that pen to come through afterwards, and it just wasn't there at all. So, And, and you're seeing it right now in Durham as an example for the season. They, they've had um, – it's an insane amount of relief days where guys are just mixed in and expected to perform. And, and even on the race side, they're getting a more than half, or a, I would say in April, the first half, at least they, they had more than half of the innings being pitched by relievers. And that's not optimal for, for any yeah. team. Now, eventually it's, it's corrected itself over time as uh, McClanahan, Kluber and Rasmussen kind of really started dominating. But I, I would say that's another area where they overcompensate, where they're so leaning on, on the relief pitchers that it can hurt them in certain instances. Right. That's a that's a good point about the relief pitching, because in the playoffs, you know, it's such a short time frame. It's such a quick, you know, a small sample size that if the bullpen isn't performing well over that small sample size, they they do falter. So, you know, I think if the playoffs were longer, like if, if we had like a 10 game series or something, maybe the Rays would, you know, fare a little bit better these past couple seasons. <laughs> um, you know, even though they were, they were good in, in 2020, that was, that was a great run, but you know, that, that, uh, that inability, I guess I would call it to rely on your starters in a shorter time frame when you really just, you know, you just need a performance. It doesn't matter who it is. You just need a guy to go out there and pitch, you know, five, six, maybe seven innings and, you know, not having, you know, someone they can go to right away has hurt them. But I like the emergence of McClanahan this year. I think Kluber, if he can, you know, stay healthy, I think he could be that guy as well. Um, just a lot of question marks outside of those two. But, you know, Drew Rasmussen starting to look like that guy. Um, yeah, just a lot of interesting options. But, you know, we just have to see how it all plays out long term. Yeah, I mean, Ben and I in, in previous shows, especially towards the beginning of the season, had had kind of spoken on on the uh us relying so much on our on our bullpen especially since you know a lot of these starters with the shortened uh spring weren't really as ready as we were hoping them to be so that's something that we've worried about as well or not worried but spoken about right right and, and it's it's fine tuning right it's not they're not huge red flags there's things that you just have to learn and uh, learn through and 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 then you look at the Dodgers run until they won the World Series. They they had like a reason yeah. every year through that to, to, say, <laughs> to say, you know, it was a long stretch. They were in the playoffs and not breaking through. So I think every team has those learning gaps. And the Blue Jays are another example of a team struggling to kind of get there. Yeah, that's a good point. So the next one we got here is – um. Uh, you know, with all the trades that they make, they make a ton of them. They've made mostly, uh, you know, most of their trades in the offseason here. Would you say in general, the Rays make the right call in trading guys away? Um, or is it maybe, I mean, it's still early to tell with a lot of them, but but how are you feeling about the Rays in terms of, I guess, winning trades? So there's a few trades. Like I, I would say there's a handful. Like since I've I've been monitoring the Rays, really closely that have kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. There was a, the Herman Marquez, this is way back. So I don't even count it towards this front office, but that, <laughs> I loved Herman Mar Marquez and I didn't understand why they gave him up. And, and he, he's in the same mold as Peyton Battenfield, which they gave up to uh, the, the Indians or the guardians recently. And, and that was a really odd trade because you don't see the Rays sending one player for two very often. And to me, that's the red flag. That's the flag of you're pushing too far because you're <laughs> giving up the best talent in the deal by far, not even close. Jordan Luplo is a nice player, but he's a fifth outfielder on most teams if you're a World Series contender. So if you were the, the Braves, he would be your Eddie Rosario, and he's not worth trading a starter, as a number two or number three for. And in my eyes, that's where Peyton Battenfield at his best will become. It's somewhere in the two to three range. So, and he's a big bodied kid. He has excellent stuff. So that one was a weird one. And it came the same year they dealt away Joe Ryan. So you're looking at two top tier pitchers. I know the Rays are really good at developing pitchers, but again, this falls into the leaning too much on your relievers. 
because they're so confident in being able to develop relievers that it lowers the value on their starters in terms of the prospects. So they gave away those two guys, and then they traded Michael Plassmeyer, Tobias Myers, a lot of guys that are kind of rounding off your rotation style guys. Uh, but you add all that in together with Drew Strotman and other guys, and that's a lot of pitching to give up. So when you're looking at Durham right now, 14 and 20, that's a big reason why. They traded away their entire rotation except for Tommy Romero. So <laughs> that's like yeah. that's an entire season that you've got <laughs> to catch up on. But then again, you look at Shane Boz, Luis Patino, and Brendan McKay on the IL, and that explains a lot of why they had to open up the, the roster room as well. So that's what I would say is – it. It's shocking a little bit in terms of the tier of talent that they've traded away, but they were going for it. So the fans have to appreciate the fact that they were trying to round off the 40-man roster and concentrate, concentrating on that above all else. So in a way, in a way, it's encouraging. Right. And I appreciate the front office like making those win now moves. Like Nelson Cruz is arguably the the biggest, you know, midseason acquisition in franchise history. Um, right. They did trade away a lot of, you know, quality pitchers, like you said, but the Rays just have so many quality pitchers that, that they, it, it's really hard to fit them all on the roster. Like they were bound to lose a couple in the rule five draft. Um, you know, we didn't know that we weren't going to have the rule five draft. So yeah. hindsight's 2020 there. So that kind of hurts, true. but um, I really like Battenfield as well. That one hurt me. Um, I liked Luplo when we got him, but then they, you know, flipped him pretty quickly. So um the jury's still out there on, I think, Ronnie Simone. I think it's Simone yeah. and not Simon, I'm pretty yeah. sure. Um, he he's good. had a pretty – he's yeah, he's been pretty good recently. Um, but he's still young, switch hitting, middle infielder. We've heard that before with the Rays. So <laughs> just, um, you know, it's it's interesting how they just keep churning through guys and hopefully they find a little bit more pitching stability down in Durham there because depth is really important. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and, and I think you he nailed it on the head when he said uh, – or Matt nailed it on the head when he said, like, we some of those guys are still on the IL, so they'll come back and be better and, and probably play for Durham. Yeah. Well, and you're going to see a few of them get promoted too. Like, Taj Bradley can't be far from, from a promotion to AAA at this point, the way he's dominating in, in – uh, in a double A level. And I'd say John Duxakis is, is really close as well. And you have like guys in, in double A that are injured as well. Like Jacob Lopez looked really good uh, last year and it's too bad. He had to go down to injury, but he'll come back next year. They have Jaden Murray and, and Michael Marcado who look really good in double A as well now. So th there's a whole movement coming up and Seth Johnson's going to jump up to double A after that. And, and you've got a boatload of guys basically to go through <laughs> it. So that's why the Rays are confident. And their draft in 21 was really solid when it comes to pitching. And that's really surprising when you consider they didn't draft a pitcher in the first five rounds. Yeah, exactly. So the fact that their pitching is showing really well tells me that that short draft they had in 2020 left open a lot of talent that they kind of were able to pick off after the fact. So, so you kind of mentioned there, uh, uh, some of the prospects that are doing really good and, and not to not to demean any of our of our prospects, obviously. But is there anyone that just hasn't hasn't clicked, hasn't gotten it going yet? Oh, there's 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 a lot of guys that I I, I I don't know if it's my you know rose colored glasses, but uh, I, I there's a lot of guys that I expected more out of early on, but it's so early in the season. I don't like to judge a, a prospect's performance early in the season because most times they're trying to tinker with their, their approach or their stuff to the point where it can hinder your performance, right? So I always like to do like the last two weeks before the All-Star game and then look at how they finish the season. And then you're more willing to put weight on that above all else because by then they've, they've tinkered with the coaches, they've said, okay, this is what we need to work on. They've worked on it, and then you kind of get to look at that span. So I'm, I'm trying to be light, especially on the pitching side. Like Some of the guys that, that, that have done really well, a lot of times it can be because their stuff is so advanced and the hitters just haven't made those adjustments to that, right? Um, especially if you're jumping up a level. Uh, so there's, there's guys that have kind of had lack, lackluster starts. Like I'll give you an example. Like Ruben Cardenas in, in – um, in Durham, I thought was going to light it up through most of it. But again, he's making an adjustment to a higher level pitching where he's getting pitched to more aggressively. They have a better uh, 
ability to attack his approach at the plate. And overall, it he still had glimpses where he's looked really solid and really good. But is it as impressive as I expected? Probably not. So uh, he'd be one that I would point to. If I go a little bit lower um, in the system, uh, I would say Shane Sasaki is one that I thought would dominate a little bit more at the plate. He's dominating on the bases. And once he's he's on, great. But But I thought his approach at the plate was so advanced, especially after watching him in the ABL. I thought he was going to have a, a, a more, uh, you know, I don't know, three, 300 and above at least uh, in terms of batting average. But again, he he's had some injuries he's dealt with. He's had to kind of adjust to higher level pitching because they only kept him in the FCL most of last year. Um, so hopefully that the second half will come around and, uh, and he can step it up. Those would be the two that I point to. Right. That those are good, uh, good players to mention there. I really like Sasaki, like you said, on the base paths. And I also like what you said about the ABL. Um, this is kind of like a follow-up question here. We didn't have this one scripted, but, um, is, are there any players that you think might benefit from going over to Australia this off season? Like we've seen, uh, Ford Proctor really go off from there. Grant Witherspoon has been incredible this year after spending some time over there. Um, it seems like that's, it's a pretty good, opportunity for players to really um you know take a step forward against um you know in an interesting situation over in australia right so i would say anybody right now that is on il and not able to play like nick schnell said no the last time they offered it to him and i would think he should jump on that like like a lion and just get out there and, and prove show us what he can do once he's back and healthy and i don't know how long that's going to be to be quite honest uh, Dylan Paulson's another guy that can go there and get some work in once he's healthy. Um, Logan Driscoll is a guy that I think could go there and be, you know, able to show off his whole uh, around off basically his whole catching aspect and kind of focus on that and getting his bat up to before he makes the jump up to double A and above. Um, those would be three that I, I would love to see down there. And also there's a guy called uh, O'Neill Manzuera who's, who's playing with Charleston. And I really like what I've seen from him in terms of how he looks at the plate, how he's looking at the game. So I, I think he, he could benefit from that as well. So this this might be a dumb question uh, because I'm not uh, – I, I focus obviously more on the Rays than I do the minor league system. Uh, but is that something like the ABL, is that something they can do while still under contract with, with the Rays in our minor league system or? Yeah. So basically I always, I, I talk to their staff a lot in, in uh, Perth and, and um, they, they get, they get together. So the Perth staff will get together with the Rays front office and they'll talk about which players may or may not be interested, which players the Rays want this, you know, to give that opportunity to. And then Perth will make those offers to those players until they find the guys that, that are willing to go and they round off their roster with those guys. So it's kind of a – it works really well, and it, it helps Perth actually attract players. It's kind of an out-of-the-way to place, right? So a lot of guys that are in Australia, that are Australians, may not want to go all the way out there. And they have a really good relationship between the two. So I think the the key there is that the players want to be there. And so a lot of times if they're on the fence or whatever, you know, you talk to guys like Grant Witherspoon and, and the rest of the guys that have gone down there and they love it. Every one of them raves about it. And they went over, over there with an open mind and they end up usually benefiting. You look at the number of guys that came out of Perth and made an impact in major league level at some point, And it's the vast majority of them. There's very few that don't, you know, end up getting at least a look or an opportunity. Um, I thought Carl Chester was one that that would end up, you know, going further than he did, but maybe the trade threw him off. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I think the Rays are one of the few teams that take advantage of that. They've gotten more other prospects because of it. I would say the, the level there, depending on the night, is about between the A and A plus level, somewhere between there. And that's why Shane Sasaki, I expected a little bit more from because to me, he could have kicked off the season in in A plus this year, and and been able to produce. So, yeah, that that's about the bulk of it. Okay, that's something that I did not know about. So, thank you for uh, no informing me on that. It's all good.
Yeah, and it seems like a, a really like optimal place for players to go to develop because a lot of the time they're playing against competition that is like slightly below where they're at, so they can build that confidence, that consistency. So yeah, I really really like what you pointed out about the ABL. So thank you for that. No problem. So I'll jump into the next question then. Uh, what's one bat and one arm that you like that's at AAA right now? So it's a weird thing because, like I said before, the, the, the arms in AAA are lacking a little bit right now um, in terms of the, the high-end potential. But I'll, I'll point one out that I'm going out a bit on a limb on that the Rays will be able to refine now that they've gotten them, and it's Ben Bowden. And I, I really liked him in the draft. I was actually doing the scouting for the for the draft when he was selected. And I was like, he seems like the kind of guy the Rays would pick up in the draft. And they didn't end up getting him then. Um, so he's a big guy, uh, has the kind of touch and feel from the left side that they usually like. Um, for me, I think the big thing is a lot of the parks that Colorado end up developing pitchers in are not optimal for pitchers. They're kind of meant to simulate the Colorado environment. So getting him out of that, I think, could be the benefit that he needs. And again, focusing on his most dominant stuff first and then working out of that, I think could have him step up a level. So to me, he's one of the big, big, big ones. And Jonathan Aranda, to me, is a top 100 prospect, if not top 50. He keeps getting overlooked, and it's because we don't put it as much for So in my eyes, if Austin Martin is a top 50 prospect, Jonathan Aranda is just as good. <laughs> yeah, His I agree. He's just as good. So there's no reason to keep him off of those lists. So to me, that the Rays noticed that, and they put him on the 40-man roster because of it. Uh, I think we're going to see him pretty soon, and I expect him to hit. How much power? We'll see. But I think that the first step in sticking around with the majors, as we've seen with Vidal Brujan and Josh Lowe, is that you need to hit. And if you don't, you're going to go back down and you're going to keep sending you back down until you prove that you can hit. So yeah. I think his transition to Major League Baseball will be smoother than Vidal Bruhan. Whether or not it's with the Rays, we'll see. But that, those are the two of point four in AAA. I really like the uh, Ben Bowden, the arm you mentioned. And I had a, a little conversation with, with uh, Cole Mitchum, the Rays metrics guy on Twitter about him and his stuff where you know those ballpark the ballpark that the Rockies play in as well as their minor league parks they tend to you know the batted balls are what kind of hurt pitchers a little bit in terms of like the results so like the home run to fly ball right the just tons of fly balls that carry over there but what really hurts them a bit more is the way the the altitude the altitude affects their stuff on the way to the plate like their pitches don't break as much and stuff like that so it'll be interesting to see how the Rays can refine his stuff in like a more traditional ballpark. So I'm really excited about him and I'm, I'm glad you brought him up. Awesome. So uh, the next one we want to um, talk about here is at the double A level, any players you are, uh, you're paying extra attention to or excited about? Grant Witherspoon should be on most people's top 10 Rays list now. Um, so he's he's really stepped up. Like I've been waiting for this from Grant. He adjusted his his stance for a while to mimic Cody Bellinger's, and well, he was in the ABL actually, and, and kind of switched back from that afterwards. He said, "No, no, we're scrapping it because it's not working out." And <laughs> this year, it's just as the season started, I was like, "Oh no, not another season where it started off slow and then boom, it just took off." And and since then, I've been really impressed. I've been watching a lot of their games. Um, he's got, he's got the pop, he's got the speed, he's on pace for a 20, 25, 26 ish season in terms of home runs, stolen bases with a really high line. I think he's, he's the next guy coming up to triple a and, and I wouldn't be surprised to see him added to the 40 man between now and, and the next rule five, if there is one or soon thereafter, uh, in terms of the pitching, uh, I had Sean Hunley. I think he's getting noticed a lot now by a lot of guys. I'm not the first one to point him out, but they drafted him 19th in, in the last draft. And, and he's just – he looks like the kind of guy uh, a little bit like uh, overconfident on the mound. Like nothing can ever shake him. You could get a double off him and be like, eh, you got a double, big deal. And then just keep moving on. His, his stuff really plays up. He can – uh, hit the top uh, of the strike zone when he wants. 
nobody's done any damage against him, even though he's been pushed to higher levels than than he probably should have. Uh, he's in double A now. Um, so, and and I don't know if you know much about what what he did when he was with Tennessee, uh, but he was leaned on a lot. Like he had 35 appearances his last time, which was a school record, and and he had ice in his veins the entire season. Um, so I'm really impressed with him, and I think if they're pushing him this this hard, it's usually a sign that they're com- confident about his stuff in the same way they were with Kobe White last year. So, so I, I think you kind of see where we're going with this now, because the next question I've got is, yeah. is an arm and a bat in a plus. <laughs> right. So I've got Mason Montgomery as the arm in, in a plus. Um, he's a guy that if you try to imagine like a Chris sale, not as, as skinny as Chris sale, but that kind of same slinging arm action, but from over the top instead of the side arm like Chris Sale has. But he's got the same kind of stuff, basically, where the, there's a lot of deception created from his the, the way that he's throwing the ball, um, a little bit less of the velocity than you know uh, Chris Sale has, but he's getting a lot of swings and misses, um, and and a lot. I, I have faith that his changeup and, and slider are both going to develop. To the point where he's going to be a strong starter uh, for a long time. So uh, he's really impressed me since they've drafted him and moved him up to uh, A plus. And Herberto Hernandez is the bad I would point out. To me, he's he's the Joey Gallo incarnated. Maybe not as good defensively in left field, but whether he plays first base or left field, he's the bat that can step into the middle of a lineup. Let's say in the six hole and, and just produce RBIs and just drive pitchers nuts because he will not swing outside the zone. And he's so disciplined in that way that he's not getting much to hit at the A and A plus levels. And when he does hit the ball, holy crap, is it ever flying? So I really like his bat. I think he'll move up to double A when Grant Witherspoon goes up to triple A. Uh, and I think that's the the next big bat basically coming up to the upper levels. And I'll just hey. keep going to the A level then. <laughs> Austin Vernon is a beast. Beast. Six foot eight, 260 pounds. I don't know. We, we can't put him on a scale, but I Good would bet Lord. it's be even more than that. And, and he just chucks the ball at 98 miles an hour. And then all of a sudden, he'll be in the upper 70s. And then all of a sudden, he'll be back at 95. And it's just <laughs> he's playing with the guys at his level. He could go up one or two levels easy this year, and I wouldn't be surprised. Really, really strong guy. Again, another guy that they selected like uh, Mason Montgomery outside of the five rounds last year's draft. Two big arms, uh, and I think uh, if you watch like uh, a lot of the videos about him online, like the, the, his teammates loved him. He threw a no hitter when he was with uh, North Carolina, and his team was just all over him. And, and he just looks like a a big bear in the mound of people. <laughs> <It's> hilarious. <laughs> uh, anyways, but his outings this year are interesting. So they've been ramping him up, not as a starter. He hasn't been starting the game, but he's been a bulk guy for the most part. And they've ramped him up from three innings per start all the way up through to 4.2 innings was his last start. And the Ks have been moving up along with that. The walks have been staying the same, about two walks per start or per outing, per bulk. Um, so I think he's on the verge of possibly joining the rotation and, and shifting over to that starting role. Uh, we'll see if that happens when promotions get worked out. But I really like Austin Vernon. And on the hitting side, this guy is in my top three now. So you know that means a lot because something. the race system is stacked. And Carson Williams deserves to be noticed by all prospect evaluators. What he's doing at 18 years old, he's making it look easy. Out of the two-hole with, with a really strong team, he's leading that team in every single way in energy. His OPS is 957. He's got 16 extra base hits and 98 at-bats, uh, which is a ridiculous rate for somebody his age. Uh, 158 WRC plus puts him in the top four in that league. And he's the youngest in that league. Uh, so if you're looking at an overall potential guy while playing strong shortstop, uh, his, his ISO is 0.2763, which is second in that league. So he's got the speed. He's, he just stole two bases yesterday. So he's got up nine stolen bases now overall. He's got the power. He's got the D he's got everything going for him. So to me, until he shows me that he can't do it at, at the next level when he moves up, he's he's part of the elite. 
So I would I would be surprised if he's not in the top 100 come midseason when people update their lists. That just got me all fired up and ready to go. <laughs> he's the next one. And it, it, may, it brings some intrigue because you're like, okay, if he makes it up in the next two or three years, you're going to have him and Franco on the left side of the infield possibly? Or Taylor Walls, and then you, you shift Taylor Walls to second maybe? Or, you know, there's so many problems like that. I call them problems. For the <laughs> <laughs> problems. But it's just a ridiculous. And then you don't even talk about Carlos Car Calmanares behind him, which is supposed to be, you know, just as much of, of an elite talent. Uh, and right now, uh, Carson Williams is making uh, – Willie Vasquez look like a chump and Willie Vasquez is a pretty decent player. So uh, I don't know if his shifting positions has something to do with his bat lagging a little bit at the beginning of the year. Um, but he's just, he's not doing as much as we expected from him uh, early on. Yeah. The Rays have a lot of quality shortstops. Um, I know you might already mentioned a couple, but like there's also junior Caminero, yeah. there's Alika Williams, like so many guys that can play, you know, one of the most difficult positions on the diamond. So um, well, Slevis I, Basabi is another. Oh one. yeah, I mean he's been pretty solid too. I think yeah. he's got an OPS like over 800 right now. Uh, speed, great discipline. Um, I you mentioned Hernandez earlier this past week. He had he's he had eight hits, seven of them went for extra bases. Like he's ready for a promotion. Just a lot of guys knocking on the door. So yeah. it's um it's it's great to be a Rays fan. Honestly, like looking at our minor leagues like this, it's it's awesome and it seems like this success is going to stick around for a while, you know, given the way they're drafting the, the things you mentioned about the way they acquire players like short term, uh, you know, to get better at the margins and then long term, you know, when they're holding guys for years and developing them, this is a really great system they've got going on right now. Yeah. And you can see that in the win loss record. Like right now they're, I, I feel like the system started slow because of a lot of the pitching issues that I mentioned before. Uh, but overall, they're still at 560 uh, winning percentage, like somewhere around there. And they're just getting warmed up. And I have no doubt that by midseason, they'll be at the top again. So when you're talking about cons consistency of how you're building your system, the Rays are so envied across MLB. And then the, the trade that they just made recently for Isak Paredes um, and, and giving them that extra draft pick, that's just adding you know fuel to the fire. So they, they have four picks in the top 73, I think, or somewhere around there. Yeah, I think I think that's right. Yeah. So that's a lot of ammunition for a system that doesn't really need it. <laughs> it's, I think one of Tampa's strongest suits is their drafting. So the fact mm -hmm. that we just have all that extra, like you said, ammunition, is it's just overkill at this point. Yeah, it's impressive. So it'll be interesting. I don't know what trades are coming up this year. I know they always like to make one to set themselves up, usually in May or June. Um, so if they can man manage it. And I think some teams are falling far enough behind. Like the Reds are falling far enough behind that they might be, you know, open more than they would have been otherwise. Uh, yeah. Maybe the A's. I don't know. People are saying Frankie Montas might be a target. But I think it'll depend a lot on Shane Boz and what he looks like when he comes back. Yeah, I think he's throwing bullpens now. I think he threw one on the 11th, I'm pretty sure. So he's um he's not too far off, and I think he's expected to be back like the the day that he's eligible, which is June 6th, I think. So hopefully he stays on track. You know, if not, if it's a couple days later, it is what it is. But so much depth, and they they will have to make moves eventually. Um, yeah, Luis Patino and Shane Boz yeah. returning is going to force their hand. If both of those guys look strong and and you know can can make it all the way through the end of the year and into the playoffs healthy because now they won't have innings limits. Like some of the, like Alec Manoa for, for the Jays, he's going to have an innings limit at some point. They're going to have to either limit his starts in terms of length or not having him available for the playoffs if they make it there. Right. So the, the Rays are kind of benefiting from that because Patino and Baz won't have that issue. If they're able to be dominant, like they can, I, I think the Rays right now need to focus on some of those guys changing their speeds more like that's the the problem with josh fleming right now in, in durham i would have him throw 40 percent change-ups i don't care just get yourself a change-up so that you can alter speeds like yarbrough does if he can do that josh fleming can be a solid five no problem but uh he needs to be able to alter those speeds a little bit more 
Yeah, Cash mentioned his piss, his pitch, not piss distri- piss <laughs> distribute, pit, something like that. Pitch distribution. Yeah, his the distribution of his piss in the in the dugout. Is just all over the place. But uh, no, he he's got to he's got to get the off speed stuff working a bit more. I think in his his start before he got sent down, he threw close to like sixty percent sinkers, and that's just not who he is. Like he's getting the ground balls, but it was a little too hard. So. Um, I think you'll be all right, but yeah, d- working on that change a bit more would be nice. Um, seems like everybody throws a splitter now. Maybe he could add a splitter or something. Those are pretty effective pitches when we've seen from Otani and now Gosman last night. Um, that might be cool. The pitch mix is a good point because if you look at Kluber last year with the Yankees and this year with the Rays, that's the major difference. They've actually leveled it out so that it's almost 30, 33% through each uh, pitch that he throws, whereas with the Yankees, he was done, you know, leaning more towards the fastball. So it'll be interesting to see if Fleming can can return at some point and uh, and help him out, or they might just do like last year and say, "Frigate, we're going to put you in the pen and and call on you when we need you for for one or two or three innings." So uh, either way, I think he'll he'll definitely be back with the team at some point. Yeah, I agree. He'll be back with the team. I I do think that with with Patino and and Boz coming back up, that I feel like a uh, a pen role is probably going to be where he's at. Uh, kind of one of those. Yep, we need you for three innings today. Let's go. All right. Again, it depends on his changeup. Like, if Patino yeah. yeah. can develop a changeup, he's elite. Like because he he you have to anchor so well for for that fastball and and wait for it. And that's what the difference with with McClanahan this year is guys can't time his stuff as well as they did last year when he was leaning more on the fastball, right? So if you're leaning too much on the fastball where they can sit on it and they know they're going to get one, then that's completely different than if you throw them chi- change your uh, – <laughs> oh, I'm having the stuttering. <laughs> <laughs> change your get- slider, then all of a sudden they're waiting for the fastball, but they're not getting it. So that's the difference is you can actually toy with them a little bit more and use that fastball more effectively. So we'll see. Well, we've, we've got our sound clip for the preview of the show this week. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man. Can you do, you're bound to slip up when you speak this much. (laughs) Oh, it, it happens. There's been times where I've just hit the intro and instantly had to cough like right after the intro. So it, it happens. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's all the questions I have for you, Matt. I don't know if Ben has any more, but. Yeah, um, I, I don't have any more, but we, I just want to know, do you have any questions for us uh, while we wrap this up here? Sure. Um, so what, what are your guys' plans with this? Like how, how often are you running it? And uh, when, when are you going to have uh, Ken Rosenthal on? To... <laughs> uh, we, so we run it. Our, our plans are to keep it growing the way that we are. Obviously we're, we're still relatively young in the the sports podcasting uh, world, but we we have a show every week. We we record every Friday or every Saturday morning, so mm-hmm. it's it's something that we all do because we love it. And and especially having guests like you on, it's been it's been awesome to get you know to get to know people in the Rays world that maybe we wouldn't have known or met yeah. um, without doing this. That's awesome. No, I recommend it for sure. And you'll be surprised how many guys are willing to jump on. So don't be shy about asking because most of them are more than willing. Like when guys have talked to Jason Stark and the rest of them, like they, they're just very open, nice people for the most part. So um, it's very rare that you'll come across somebody that's not willing to come on and, and have at least a chat when it's, you know, works out for them for sure. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Yeah. So, is there uh, is there anything you want to plug, like your Twitter? I know you're you're pretty active on there with your raise stuff. Um, and yeah, anything that's like the only that. one I'm really working on right now, steadily, is because I've got so many irons and other fires right now. So that <laughs> my time is kind of I focus so much on the minors, and there's four teams you got to kind of look yeah. through all the time. So I watch the, on average about two games a day. So when, when you're doing that, your time is kind of limited. So I kind of put running my own site aside and I wasn't really going to be making any money from it or anything like that. So it was more of a joy than, than anything else. Um, so I'm more focused on the Twitter handle for sure. So Matt, it's at M-A-T underscore Germain underscore. And that's pretty much, you know, if you want to know what's going on in the race system, then I usually try to keep tabs on it and, uh, and let everybody know. 
Yeah, I mean, I feel like I don't even have to look at the minor league box scores like every day. I can just go to your Twitter and it's like, all right, this guy, like the trends and who's performing, who's, you know, moving around, who's getting promoted. So it's great stuff. And I definitely recommend uh, that anybody should follow you that's listening. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for having me on, guys. I'll let you guys finish up the, the rest of the show with uh, with your schedule. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely come on again if you guys will have me. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, we would definitely I I guarantee you we'll have you on at some point again. It'd be awesome. I really enjoyed this conversation. Perfect. Awesome. All right. So that was an, an awesome conversation with Matt. And and now we get into the the nitty gritty of of what we do here uh every week, and that is review our week that has been for the Rays. Um and that'll start off with the the eight to two victory uh, at Seattle. Uh with uh with old Rasmussen pitching for us. Yeah, just a, a, a pretty solid game overall for the Rays. Um I feel like they dominated uh offensively. Their expected batting average was like a hundred and twenty points higher than Seattle's. Like we were at like three three forty eight. Um overall great work by the bullpen again. Thirty percent whiff rate for Poche in that game just looked great i know rasmussen didn't have too many uh swings and misses that game but it is what it is and everybody contributed just a a solid performance there yeah and and again i think our like aside from obviously we had low homer and we had our low geez wow wow sorry guys (laughs) we had low homer twice and margot just continued his ungodly hot streak uh so we've i feel like our offense was clicking with some of our guys but we did have a lot of offers in there uh and i don't know if that's something to be maybe a little worried about at this point um i mean the the results for some of the guys weren't fantastic but they still hit the ball hard like i said the expected batting average like they they realistically could have and should have got you know, more hits than they did. But um, like you said, Lau and Margot kind of did most of the damage there in that game. They picked up their their teammates. So um, nothing really concerned about there. I thought the bullpen was really strong, though. Like Rayleigh was great in that game. Um, I already mentioned Poche. Garza was, wasn't was great, but he ate up two innings, and that's pretty important yeah. when you're on like a 700-game a road trip out on the West Coast. So they kind of needed that, but... Yeah, overall, I was I was pretty happy with that game. Yeah, that game was one of the the happier games I had this week, uh, and, and I'll use that to go right into the next game where uh, someone who I do not ever give props on this show, but Ben loves very much, Mr. Ryan Yarbrough comes in and pitches for us, and actually has a good game, uh, like a very good game. I I was impressed with his his overall performance, so I got to give. Mr. Yarbrough and and Mr. Ben, a little bit of kudos for for calling this one, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, Yarbrough was great. He had two hard hit balls in five innings and um, uh, George Kirby. Yeah, I think it's George, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, He he had a great debut, but on the other side of that, he had seven hard hit balls in six innings. So I think, you know, Yarbs outpitched him in that sense and the Rays hitters they they did better um their expected batting average was 20 points higher they were at 243 so this was a game that they could have and should have won but manfred ball makes it a coin toss uh bullpen <laughs> i sound like a broken record here but they were great again jason adam had a negative 0.93 fit so just insane stuff from him and uh margot of course hit another home run because that's what he does at this point so just a, a solid I- game but unfortunately that's not it, it, you know, they didn't get the win, but it's it's fine. It's Rob Manfred. Yeah, we didn't get the result we wanted, but this was another one of those games. We kind of talked about it last week about games that we just felt like we were going to lose. This is one of those games where I felt like we were going to win. And at the end of it, I still wasn't upset that we lost because it just felt like we played solid baseball. Uh, and I was I was talking to Matt before the show started and and he was saying that and we both kind of were on the same page with Margot. I don't know if it was this new contract or or what it was, but he seems just so much more confident and and able at the plate this season than I've ever seen him. I actually kind of – so 
I probably could have mentioned this earlier, but I wrote about Margot and his, you know, high leverage hitting the numbers behind it. And there wasn't, you know, there's really no explanation for that kind of stuff. Either guys hit in high leverage or they don't. It's not, you know, predictive if they're going to keep doing it. But something that I did speculate on that does kind of make sense is like the psychology of his high leverage success. And it likely could come from that he just feels like he or he feels like he's comfortable in Tampa. Like they've given him a contract extension, a pretty nice one. Uh, They gave him a mutual option. So that's a pretty rare thing in sports contracts. Like usually it's a player option or a team option. Uh, The option on this contract is a mutual one, which is interesting because, you know, both sides would have to agree to extend the contract. So, you know, if he wants to extend it for a third year and the Rays say no, then it's, you know, pretty awkward and (laughs) uncomfortable. But I think the Rays are, you know, they're doing an interesting psychological thing here where they're kind of just, you know, they're going to extend his third year contract or his his third year option, like no matter what, but they're like giving him a say in it, even if he technically doesn't really have a say, because of course he's going to stick around. He loves it here, (laughs) but it's just interesting that they're like, they they've really built him up mentally and we are seeing the results of that. So um, he did add like 10 pounds of muscle this off season. So um, he does look a little bit bulkier and you know, he's been hitting for more power, but the rays are, are treating him right. And, it, it's really helping his mentality. So um, lots of success from him so far, and I think we're going to continue to see that. Yeah, and you mentioned your article, on, and we uh, Eureka mentioned that we are going to go ahead and link that in the description. That way um, all you beautiful fans out there listening can can read how just crazy Ben is with his articles. In a good way, crazy, like, crazy good, I mean. <laughs> uh, so then, yeah, I mean, is there any – aside from us – expecting to win that game was there anything else from that game that you noticed um they could have not pitched to tie france in the 10th yeah. um they they did and it's fine like it felt like the result was inevitable at that point in the in the bottom of the 10th but um maybe they could have walked him it doesn't really matter it's just it's nitpicking it it doesn't feel necessary but they could have done it maybe extended the game a bit longer um it kind of feels like it would have been like the thing they do in basketball where they just keep like sending guys to the free throw (laughs) line, hoping they mess up. Yeah. (laughs) Just like walk a France, like walk him to first base and let, you know, (laughs) just force the next man to, to do something with it. So, um, but it still kind of felt inevitable. So it's fine. Yeah. I I can't disagree with you. It it just felt like it it was one of those games where no matter how good we were, it was, we were, we were going to lose it. It's again, you, you said it best uh, Manfred ball. (laughs) Like There's just nothing you can do about it. Yeah, but then the next game um, didn't look as great. Uh, you know, yeah. we had Jeffrey Springs out there against uh, Syndergaard, and it was it was a bit of a tough one. I think it was closer than the scoreline suggests. But yeah, I don't know. What do you think of that game? Uh yeah, I I I love Otani when he's not playing us, but now I think I hate Otani. <laughs> That's basically all I can say to to this to, to this game. Uh, no, it, overall, not a terrible, like like you said, the score it looks really bad, but I didn't, when I was watching it, I didn't think it was that bad uh, up until, obviously, the Grand Slam. That one kind of hurt a little bit. But we did have, you know, Springs comes out and throws four innings of three earned runs, uh, and then Beeks follows him up with three innings of three home run or of three runs. So it just kind of it felt like our pitching couldn't get going this game, and uh, I mean, granted, it is against the Angels, who, if I'm not mistaken, mistaken, are the best team in baseball right now, uh, are close to it at least. So it, it's kind of expected, but just painful to see the the one thing that I think Tampa does so amazing kind of not be amazing. Yeah, Beeks had a really weird outing. Um, his fastball was really like loopy. It was missing like loopy in the sense that like it was going up and down and not it wasn't as flat as it normally was, which, you know, you want a flat fastball um, in terms of vertical movement. So his stuff still graded out pretty well. So, you know, it is what it is. It was still like an expected run value. It was Beeks' third best outing of the season. So he was still pretty solid. He just didn't get the results. Um, I thought Springs looked really good. And his 4.33 FIP is pretty misleading um, when you consider that the smog really affected the Rays outfielders. Like 
they were having trouble picking up the ball all night. And then, you know, they lost that one, which gave the angels an extra out horrible umpiring. Uh, he had to strike him out like twice before he hit the home run. So it is what it is. And and that's ultimately what did him in. Uh, he was really efficient. He had a 39% whiff rate, the change in the slider were working for him, but, um, yeah, I think the the smog and the umpires really set the tone there, and the Rays just couldn't come back from it. Uh, they still had a 314 expected batting average that game compared to the Angels at 251, but the ball just you know didn't find the grass enough, I guess. Um, yeah, Angels offense is still pretty good though, so not to take too much away from them, but it could have it could have been different if like one or two more calls like you know early on went their way. So not too upset about that game though. Yeah, so that's one of those games where uh, not to harp on. Oh uh, well, we did have a debut in that game though, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, that's true. So I'll let you talk a little more on that because that's uh, I know you had some Twitter words about it. <laughs> yeah, he only threw. So Calvin Fauche made his debut, which is great. Yeah, he's got probably one of the the highest spin rate curveballs ever. Um, it averages in the minors at least he didn't he didn't show it too much in the majors um in his outing but it averages like close to 3200 rpm so it's like that's that would that's like 300 more than charlie morton averages and charlie yeah. morton's got a great curveball so yeah his curve is amazing but he only threw three in that game so i don't really understand why he only threw three of them um you know some people i talked to said it was maybe like a sequencing thing or he just you know wasn't feeling it that night or wasn't confident in it, whatever. Um, so that kind of sucks because that curveball is really cool. And the ones that he did throw, I think he had like a 60% whiff rate. So he was, or a called strike and whiff rate, something like that. But he looked great with the curve when he threw it. He just didn't throw it enough. And the Rays are typically like in the business of having their pitchers throw their best pitch as much as possible. As much, so. Yeah, exactly. He'll probably uh, be fine though going forward. Yeah, I think he will. And it was exciting to see him debut. Um, but speaking of another, another rookie in the next game, the very next game, I know that, uh, he technically got his debut last year at the, towards the end of the year, but Reed Detmers comes in and becomes the youngest pitcher in angels history to throw a no hitter. Um, what were you, how, what were your takes on the next game? The 12 to zero loss. Uh, that game didn't happen to me. Like it was, it was a, it was a two game series against the Angels. So I don't really know what you're talking about. That game yeah, we tied happened. the series. I, I, I yeah, saw the same it, thing. Yeah. yeah, it was weird for them to throw an off day like in the middle of a series like that. But whatever, we'll, we'll split the two gamer. No, but really though, um, you know, it was, it was cool to see a no hitter. Like it's always cool to watch that. That's probably the worst no hitter I've ever seen in my life, though. Like not to take too much away from him, because like it's hard to throw a no hitter, but like yeah, it, he was not good. Um, he had nine hard hit balls that game. Kluber allowed eight, um, and Kluber was was I thought was pretty solid overall. Um, aside from a couple mislocated pitches, but um, Detmer's also had a higher expected FIP than Kluber. Um, I saw a tweet uh, that like the Rays had whatever over like the two game span in the first two games against the Angels, they had forty two balls in play um and there was like a a one a point one three babip on those balls like it just insanely unlucky um he struck out two guys like that's i could <laughs> exactly. I, I could probably do that if you put me out there long enough um just <laughs> you heard it I, first I, guys <laughs> i'm i really was not impressed with that no hitter like good for him but like i i feel like a, a seven inning bullpen no hitter would be more impressive than that yeah. just because the the lack of swing and miss the the tons of hard contact just it's frustrating but like good game i guess like i'm i'm annoyed yeah i figured uh that otani had his night so trout how to had to try and one up and hit hit his two home runs best player in all of baseball i don't care what anyone says uh still don't like him but best player in all of baseball you kind of expect him to go off at some point against your team no matter who you are um, but we did get a little bit of the other two-way sensation in all of baseball, Mr. Brett Phillips. <laughs> I mean, I got to stay strong a little bit. Uh, but, yeah, no, overall, not a great game by either pitcher. and not a, I mean, great outcome for one of them, but not a great game. I, I agree with you 100% on that. And that takes us right into our next game, which we actually finally 
when we take one from the Angels, we didn't get swept. That's the that's the key there. Uh, and that was a um, Shane McClanahan start. Eleven Ks in that game. That was he's 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 a beast. He pitched about like maybe five or six times better than Detmers and didn't get a no hitter. Like <laughs> it's crazy how baseball works like that. But McClanahan, like I don't want to say it was a must win, but like he showed up and he said, Nope, this losing streak stops with me. I'm going to turn it around. And he just took the game into his own hands. And when he was dealing, um, he had a 0.41 FIP, 0.79 expected FIP, 52% whiff rate. Like this was the best game of his career honestly yeah no i i agree it, it just phenomenal I, I don't even know how else to i don't know any other words other than just phenomenal masterful just a great great pitching performance by mcclanahan and i think he's slowly showing us more and more why as much as i love glass now that he can be the ace that we need in the future now tomorrow whenever yeah, definitely. And he he deserved a no hitter in that start more than Detmers did for sure. <laughs> um, but I I'll just I'm just going to drop it because it's just annoying. Like, <laughs> yeah, it, it's so stupid. Um, Pusha and Fire Eisen looked great. They had a 57 percent whiff rate combined in that game and a negative point five one fit like they were on it. Bullpen was on it again. Um, Kittredge was a bit unlucky, but Brooks Raley just has some some big Hones and he gets it done so really like what i saw from him and the rays are stealing a lot of bases um i noticed that a while ago but this game like really showed it um so that was pretty cool i think they might be leading the league in, in stolen base percentage which is interesting because we've seen a rosa reina kind of fumble around the bases a bit but no they're they've been a great base running team um in terms of stolen bases and like going first to third second to home stuff like that so um good base running as a team yeah, and I'll jump into hitting a little bit too. Uh, we got another Kiermaier bomb, which is already more than I was expecting on the whole season, and we're not even at the halfway point. So <laughs> uh, overall, not great hitting numbers, but not terrible. Wander Franco did go 0 for 5, which is kind of uh, surprising to me, <laughs> considering he's been honestly one of our most consistent hitters. Maybe not hitting for power, but hitting – consistently like he was to start his career last season. But yeah, I mean, that was a, another just late inning comeback, not comeback win, but late inning win that we had to pull out from our rear ends because we can't ever just win a game by 15 <laughs> points. <laughs> no, we can't, we can't it's have gotta a be entertaining. Win. Yep. I mean, Otani was good. He was, he was really solid that game, but, it was really cool to see McClanahan be better than him. Like that felt really good. So yeah, yeah, just a really great start for McClanahan. The offense eventually picked it up, and and we got the win. So that was cool. Yeah, well, then we we finally had a an off day. I feel like we get too excited. Us here at RBLR get too excited for these off days that the Rays get because they are just, and it's not just the Rays. I know it's most MLB teams. But it, it is just an exhausting schedule for them, man. Yeah, a 13 game West Coast road trip with without an off day is that I feel like that's not fair, but baseball isn't fair and there's no crying in baseball, so we just gotta get over it. Exactly. But I'm not playing baseball, so I'm gonna cry when I have to stay up till twelve <laughs> o'clock to watch the game go out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, while you're crying, though, you could soak up your tears with um, some nice merch from shop.rblrsports.com. You know, we've got some really great team-inspired T-shirts and um, lots of lots of really great stuff. We got our, our Rays, our Bucks, our Lightning, our Rowdies, our Bandit stuff now. So um, lots of options for, for you and your loved ones to buy some tear-soaking T-shirts. <laughs> yeah, and if they use that... Uh... That promo code Flappy, that is F L A P P Y, uh, that'll get you guys ten percent off any shirts you guys buy, uh, and that doesn't matter if you buy one or twenty. So the more you buy, the more you save. Science. That's true. <laughs> uh, so we'll just jump right into the next game, then the last game of the show, so, so to speak. Uh, we get a five to two win on another great outing by Drew Rasmussen. Uh, 
I say great not because of strikeout numbers, just by overall performance, obviously, because he a whopping one strikeout, which was only one less than Detmer's no hitter. <laughs> Yeah, this felt this was literally like almost a carbon copy of of Detmer's performance in terms of like the the swing and miss and the batted balls and stuff. Like Drew Rasmussen had a twelve percent whiff rate. Like, uh, I I don't even know what to do with that number. Like that's that's insane. But he did have a sixty eight percent ground ball rate. The the league average this year is forty three percent. So he was just getting tons of ground balls. Uh, defense made you know most of the plays behind him. A couple hiccups, but overall really solid. Uh, he had a 3.3 FIP, which was decent, not great, but good enough. And he he outdueled Gosman uh, yeah. in a way. I mean, not completely because Gosman still looked really good, but Rasmussen, uh, he did what he needed to do when he had to, and uh, he got the results. So, you know, kudos to him for that. Yeah, this was one of those games where it was, if if you liked defensive baseball like it felt like this was your game and it wasn't even necessarily a a pitching duel it was just a good it felt like a really good baseball game to watch if you enjoy like old school kind of baseball yeah we saw some really good like you know players doing the little things right uh brandon lau uh, he had two triples that game which is cool one of them was a little lucky but he had some great base running he scored on a ground ball fielder's choice in the first um just a really just the perfect slide really he touched like the outside of the plate gets the first run in for the rays like really underrated base running there from brandon lau and he had a really nice play too when he he bluffed like going home to help Randy steal second, like late in the game. So the catcher kind of like did a pump fake thing and threw a third instead of second. So Randy was able to steal a base because Lau kind of like, you know, lingered on the, on the third baseline a little bit. So just really heads up stuff from him. And it's really fun to watch him when he's on base. So I hope he continues to keep getting on base. Yeah. And then an another, I mean, obviously Lau and Mejia kind of closed the game out for us, but Margot put us up for good in the in the eighth inning again i feel like the only game this week that margot didn't have an outcome in or didn't have any input in was the one game that if i'm not mistaken the one game that he missed yeah he was he he came through again i think the the single he had the rbi single had like a 120 expected batting average so wasn't exactly like hitting the cover off the ball but it, he put it in, in the perfect spot so uh, you know, he got it done. I thought Zanino could have had a bigger game than he did. Yeah. He had a couple really hard hit balls, but the the dead ball has been killing him this year because he's got he supplies a lot of the power. He just needs like an extra foot sometimes, and and he's got a couple home runs. But again, the bullpen's great. Sixty three percent whiff rate from Jason Adu who gets his first save. Uh, the bullpen in their three point one innings pitch had a one point three two fifth. They just looked amazing. Um, little unlucky from Rayleigh, but again, he does sometimes have those struggles against righties. So it, it's understandable that he wasn't perfect, you know, yesterday, but Kittredge came in and kind of righted the ship after having a couple uncharacteristic outings. Like he doesn't give up a ton of home runs, but for some reason, Abraham Toro of the Mariners, just like the home runs against him, but Kittredge turned it around, got the double play ball that he needed, which is, you know, a lot of what we saw a lot of last year. Just a, a solid team performance. It feels like, you know, a lot of players contributed. Uh, Rasmussen was great. Bullpen was great. Bats were were pretty good. So, yeah, it, it's great to go out there and beat Toronto's best pitcher. Yeah, it, uh, it definitely made me more comfortable against Toronto than I was expecting to be. I was, I was a little worried about Toronto coming into the, the series because, like I said last week, this was kind of, the test of one of the tougher teams, in my opinion, in our in our division. So to see us come out and, and get a win against arguably their best pitcher was relieving to me. Yeah, it was great. And overall, a pretty solid week. Like they went, what, uh, what is this, like six? No, one, uh, uh, two, three. So three and three this week. Is that what we're looking at? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's fine considering, you know, the no hitter could be pretty demoralizing sometimes and that might send things in a spiral, but a 3 and 3 week uh to close off a 7 and 3 road trip. 
uh, that's that's fine with me. You know, we got the off day. That's what we needed. Yeah, exactly. And now, so I'm going to throw this to you because I, I can't lie. I'm having a hard time um, with an arm of the week. So I would like to throw it to you for your arm of the week. Uh, it's got to be McClanahan for me. Okay. I thought about Rasmussen, but in terms of, the, you know, war and value to the team, McClanahan went out there and did it. So, so I, that was the same, uh, internal battle I was having was either Rasmussen or McClanahan, uh, just based off Rasmussen played one more game essentially, but McClanahan did have the, the best overall game and probably you mentioned it earlier, the best game of his career. So I, I am completely on board for uh for mcclanahan being our our pitcher of the week yeah and he did it against a pretty strong angels offense too so you know to have a 75 percent ground ball rate and a 0.42 fit you know against that offense that's that's pretty impressive i know trout was you know he didn't come into the game till much later as a pinch hitter but uh he's not the only bat in that offense that yeah exactly hit it over the exactly. wall so just a good game from McClanahan there. And yeah, he's definitely my pitcher of the week. All right. So is there rules against making the same batter of the week, <laughs> hitter of the week, uh, the guy? Because I, I'm going with Margot again. I feel like every, no matter what, every game he was in, he had some sort of say on what happened. Um, we may have still lost, but he's still hitting home runs. He's still scoring. It just, he is my bat of the week this week, without a doubt. Yeah, he was he was solid. I almost went with Lau just because of the sample size. And yeah, uh, Lau was was uh, was not too far behind in terms of weighted runs created. So he was really close there. Um, He was also close in war, but Margot still had a point six F war this week. Um, 20 percent walk rate, six point seven percent strikeout rate to go along with three stolen bases, Um, three, three sixty three WRC plus just really hitting the ball a lot and everywhere. And he also had a 0.47 win percentage added, which is awesome. Like he was worth about half a win this week, which is really impressive for considering like, you know, that's one guy doing that in 15 plate appearances. So really good stuff from Margot. The the crazy part is that, so as wild as half of a win by yourself is, that was down from last week. (laughs) (laughs) Right. That's insane to me. Uh, but yeah, so that's our whole week of Rays baseball. Like mixed of feelings week. Uh, overall, I would say that I felt very good about this week, aside from that one game that didn't happen. Um, so aside from that one, I feel very good about how our week went out. Like we didn't lose to a team that we should have beat, beaten, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean the the no hitter didn't happen, so they went three and two this week. That's that's solid. That's uh, essentially, yeah. Shirt. I, I can't, I feel like we can't speak on that enough. Um, so that, that kind of leads us into next week. What are your expectation or expectation expectations, your expectations from last week or from this week coming up? Uh, I think, I think we're going to see Wander perform a little bit better. He, he started, to, he's not cooling off cause he's still like, you know, hitting the ball well and making hard contact, but I think we're going to see him make a little bit more, uh, a couple more adjustments at the plate Um, he's definitely learning as the games go on. Like we saw that against Gosman, like he looked a little lost in the first at bat. Then he got more comfortable as the game went on. Um, I would have liked to see him face him a fourth time because I feel like he really would have got to him. But Charlie Montoyo probably felt the same way. So, you know, we got him out of there just in time. And I think we're going to see the Rays. I think we're going to see him sweep Toronto. It feels like Toronto looks a little lost with their, their bullpen. And Alec Manoa is going to be good today, but he, um, he's overperforming like crazy and the, he did dominate the Rays last season, but the Rays also have a lot of experience against him. So I think they're going to be able to turn it around today. And after they beat him today, um, no, no, uh, Manoa's on, on Sunday. Not yeah. Today. I would say, I think Manoa's Sunday. Yeah. I started, I did my game notes for tomorrow already. I'm trying to get ahead of it. So <laughs> I was like, yeah, Manoa, he's pitching today. Now he goes tomorrow um, on Sunday. So, yeah, I think I think we can sweep Toronto. What about you? Uh, I'm all for it. Uh, I, I uh, optimistically we sweep Toronto. Um, maybe more realistically, we win the series. Uh, but I, I do think we win the series no matter what. 
Yeah, and Toronto's like finally starting to see some adversity. Like they've really had smooth sailing all season, kind of like the Yankees. But everybody's going to run into some trouble. Uh, George Springer's a little banged up. Teoscar Hernandez was a little, um, a little slow getting down the first baseline late in that game. So they're starting to run into some adversity, and teams can't avoid that forever. So I think we're going to see. Um, I don't think they're going to just completely free fall, but I, I don't think they're going to be playing 500 ball for the next week or so. Yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. And in my, my last prediction that I'll get into is I do think that Margot continues the hot streak. I, I really <laughs> I, do. I, yeah. I don't know why. I just have a feeling that this is a tear that he's going to be on for a little while. I, yeah, he's just, he's getting stuff done. Um, and it's like a mental thing. So who knows when it's going to end? It's kind of like on the flip side, like when a pitcher or a hitter is, is, you know, struggling mentally, like we don't know when they can turn it around, but Margot, he's not struggling. He's doing the opposite. And exactly. He's, he's just believing in himself and he's, you know, staying within himself. He's not trying to do too much. He's doing what he can do and it's working for him. So I hope he can continue to do that. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and so before we, before we get out of here and, and give the let the fans go watch some baseball, um, we have some injury updates, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, we covered a couple of them with, uh, with Matt earlier, so I won't you know talk about all of them. But let's see. Uh, Chagua, he's, he threw a bullpen on the 11th. He's starting to work his way back. Uh, still waiting on an update for Fairbanks, but he's slowly getting there. Um, the most interesting one, uh, we touched on it very lightly with Matt, but Brennan McKay, he is not, he hasn't completely given up the two-way thing, but he is only rehabbing as a pitcher right now. So I think that's pretty interesting. Um, in the past, you know, with his injuries, he's had a lot of injuries in his very short career so far, but he would rehab like, you know, on both sides of the ball, but this time he's just rehabbing as a pitcher. So if he comes back as just a pitcher, he'll be on the big league club pretty quickly. Like he's, he's, he's a big league arm already. Yeah. Uh, the bat, yeah. the bat's a bit behind, but yeah, overall just everybody continues to hurry up and get healthy. So some good right. stuff. Yeah. So overall that's, I mean, good news. Um, so I will, I will send it over to you then Mr. Whitelaw. Anything, anything else you want to touch on? You want the lot, you know, kind of give you the last word, my man. No, just um, the the six oh six winning percentage they have right now puts them on pace to win ninety eight games. That's pretty awesome considering they haven't really hit their stride yet. Um, I think they could start hitting it this week if uh, if things go right for them. They need a little bit of good luck sometimes, so hopefully we'll see that. But yeah, thank you everybody for listening. I hope you enjoyed our our guest today. He was awesome. Make sure you follow him on Twitter. I know he plugged his stuff early in the show, so. Go back and listen if you missed it. But you can also follow us at RBLR Sports on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, like and subscribe to us on Spotify, the iHeartRadio app, Apple and Google Podcasts, YouTube, all that stuff. Um, you could do that and buy a shirt. Um, but if, <laughs> if you like free things, you know, you could just like, subscribe, follow. Uh, follow us individually. Follow us collectively. Just follow us to the grocery store. I don't know. Whoa, yeah, now. It, whoa. <laughs> I don't live in open Florida in, anymore, so open invitation to go to Zach's house. I'm gonna put his address in the description. Uh, yeah. Oh goodness. <laughs> All righty, guys. Well, again, we uh, Ben said it best. Uh, give us a like, give us a follow. We really appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate you guys as well, just for sticking around. If you made it this far, you guys are the real MVPs. Um, forget all the baseball talk. You guys just in general are the real MVPs. So we appreciate you guys, and we look forward to talking to you guys next week. Go Rays. Thank you for tuning into this presentation by RBLI Sports. On your way out of the stadium, please remember to like and subscribe.